Greetings once again, traveler. Come sit and listen to my tale. I, your chronicler, have yet another story to tell you of the 1980s, or the days of high adventure. But our tale begins far before the rise of the sons of Eternia, to the days before the oceans drank Atlantis, the 1960s. At that time, the mythical toy company known to mortals as Marx created many different playsets for the young ones to enjoy. Among these playsets were classics, such as the medieval Castle Fort playset and the dimly remembered Castle Attack playset. And for decades, these playsets were enough, but history becomes legends and legends become myths, and the ages of man change. And a new age would dawn. An age where great warriors would fight dark demons throughout all kinds of media, including cinemas and comic books, and in effigy in the hands of the little ones. And most importantly, this time would see the rise of the Dungeons & Dragons game, which would lead to a torrent of tabletop role-playing games. And the figurines that manufacturers such as Citadel, Grenadier, and the infamous Ral Partha would manufacture to aid in the playing of these games. But something happened that none of them intended. An idea came to the small, unknown manufacturer of playsets Dimensions for Children to mix the sword and sorcery aesthetic with the molded figurine playset. And thus, Dragon Riders of the Styx was born, and with it came a horde of fantasy and sword and sorcery playsets, a type of toy that would be found in toy aisles and various stores throughout the lands. Come, and hear my tale of great battles fought on printed plastic mats, placed on shag carpets and kitchen tables throughout the world of the 1980s. This is the saga of the sword and sorcery playset, a staple of the 1980s. In 1981, the toy company Dimensions for Children, or DFC, released what is speculated to be the first sword and sorcery molded figurine playset of the 1980s. Buoyed by the popularity of Dungeons and & Dragons and Masters of the Universe, this type of toy quickly became popular and many more playsets would follow. In fact, DFC would go on to release five more fantasy figurine toy playsets in 1981, including the Forest of Doom, the Tower of Night, and the Fires of Shandar, as well as the Dungeons and Demons of Castellon. Dragon Riders of the Styx was their largest and most involved playset and would go on to become their most famous, thanks in part to the line of action figures and accessories they would release under the same name. The playsets conformed to a pretty standard form. They usually included various knights, wizards, vikings, ogres, and goblin type creatures, and usually at least one dragon. They would also often include several molded plastic structures such as castles or mountains, as well as cardboard structures and terrain in the smaller sets. And almost all of them would come with a printed plastic playmat that depicted various land features and terrain such as rivers, lakes, labyrinths, or dungeon structures. This was a format that almost all of the toy playsets at this time would adhere to. These playsets became so popular that they were featured in Christmas catalogs of the time. Here is a page from the J.C. Penney Christmas catalog from 1982. It includes the Dragon Riders of the Styx playset, not surprising as sword and sorcery toys were all the rage for the next few years. All of the DFC or Dimensions for Children's playsets included the same basic figurines with only a few variations or figures that are exclusive to some playsets. 
These playsets gave children of the 1980s a format to live out grand and large-scale battle sequences between heroic knights and hideous monsters, such as in the Lord of the Rings novels, something that was nearly impossible to do with the standard fantasy action figure toy lines of the time. The second largest of DFC's sword and sorcery playsets was the Dungeons or Demons of Castellon. Unlike the larger Dragon Riders of the Styx playset, the Castellon playsets took place in a dungeon setting and not the wide open battlefield surrounding a defended structure. I suppose it's possible that the Castellon playsets took place below the castle found in the Dragon Riders of the Styx playset. Certainly the Castellon sets felt a lot more like a Dungeons and Dragons game setting. And were likely used as the setting for battles between small bands of heroic adventurers and dungeon lurking creatures, perhaps in pursuit of ancient treasures. It is possible that the Castellon playsets were inspired by D&D game maps, as well as D&D inspired board games from the same time period. It is also possible that such playsets helped set the stage for other great tabletop dungeon exploration games that would be produced in the following years. One of the figurines that would be included with the Castellon playsets was the Horrible Worm Men. These snake-like creatures bore close resemblance to the Dungeons & Dragons creature known as the Naga. Of course, this type of creature could be seen throughout sword and sorcery and fantasy fiction long before the introduction of the Naga. Nonetheless, the figure did bear a remarkable resemblance to David Sutherland's picture in the 1977 Monstrous Manual. And it is possible that is why later editions of the toy came with the faceless worm men instead of the more detailed version. The Dungeons and Demons of Castellon playsets are relatively rare, and many sources say the two playsets were nearly exactly the same. And that the name Dungeons of Castellon was changed to Demons of Castellon due to legal pressure from Dungeons and Dragons printing company TSR. But the Dragon Riders, the Styx playset, and the Castellon playsets were only the beginning. DFC would also create three other smaller playsets that used the same basic figurines but with different cardboard features, as well as plastic terrain play mats. The first we'll look at is my favorite, the Forest of Doom. The Forest of Doom pitted a band of heroic knights and wizards against an assortment of ogres, demons, and man-eating trees. The trees are made out of cardboard and the set did not contain any plastic structures, but still look neat to my childhood standards. With this set, kids could fight their own version of the Battle of Isengard, but the tree's taking a more sinister role, I suppose. Let's face it, everyone loves monster trees. The next playset by DFC was the Tower of the Night playset. This was very similar to the Forest of Doom, and the titular Tower of Night was created out of foldable and infinitely more perishable cardboard. But once again, it sure looked great. I'm sure that a lot of scotch tape was employed to keep that tower viable over time. And again, the Battle of the Wizard's Tower is a common trope in fantasy literature and one we will see in these types of playsets again and again. Last, we have the Fires of Shandar. The Fires of Shandar take place near a volcano or some kind of Mount Doom type setting. And once again, it generally uses the same figurines as other DFC play sets. 
This one came with a flaming stone tower or perhaps some sort of fantasy volcano. Somebody throw a ring into that thing, quick. This set included a unique figurine that was called a Flaming Man on the package. Probably a lava demon of some kind. Interestingly, the lava monster looked very similar to the early depictions of the Dungeons & Dragons plant monster called the Shambling Mound, which in turn looked a lot like the Marvel Comics swamp creature called the Man-Thing. TSR would later release a PVC figure of this monster with their Advanced Dungeons & Dragons toy line that was created to directly interact with LJN's toy line of the same name. And once again, almost all DFC sets use the same basic figures with differing terrain playmats and accessories. If you were around 5 or 6 years old in the early 1980s, you likely owned one of these sets or encountered one at a friend's house. But DFC simply lit the fires of war, and they raged throughout other toy companies who saw a war path to big money. The very next year, in 1982, several toy companies jumped on the sword and sorcery war wagon and created playsets of their own. One of the earliest was the toy company Miner, who was a subsidiary of MPC. Miner created the Dragon Crest Medieval Fantasy Adventure playset. And this was pretty easy for them, as Miner owned the rights to many of the older Marks playset figurine molds. So much of the playset's knights and features utilized the molds from the older Marks Medieval playsets. But the really interesting thing about this set is the monster figures that were created to fight the knights. Let's take a closer look. Yep, those monsters look awful familiar. They look like classic Halloween and classic movie monsters. That's because they are. Miner reused the monsters from the older Marks play sets that featured classic horror movie monsters from the 1960s. A quick and easy way of giving those knights monster enemies to fight. Ah! And in a way it made sense since many of these monsters have been featured in the Dungeons and Dragons monster manual since the very beginning. Miner would offer a slightly modified version of Dragon Crest Castle in the 1982 Sears Wishbook Christmas catalog. This version, called Mysterious Castle, was generally the same, but had a few key differences. The most important of these differences was the dragon that was included with each set. The Sears version, the Mysterious Castle, featured a cardboard dragon whose head fit into a cave in a cardboard mountain. The Dragon Crest version of the playset featured a rubber dragon of a familiar type. The dragon that featured in the Dragon Crest Castle playset was one of those rubber ugly wuggly toys that were sold in boxes like the old Imperial Dinosaur toys. But Miner and PC weren't done there. In 1982, they partnered with TSR to create two action scene scenario kits for use with those D&D type figures to enhance gameplay. The first was called Orc War, a siege battle type scenario. Both of these sets came with vacuum-formed plastic bases and several figurines. And they certainly fell more into the models category than toy play sets, but they were still an interesting addition to the range of available sword and sorcery sets from that time. The second was called Dungeon Invaders, a dungeon raid type scenario. Dungeon Invaders gave players an interactive dungeon scene for their games. The figures were unpainted and time and effort was required to construct the scene. Painting and adding details was expected.
and there were still many more fantasy playsets to come. HG Toys threw their hat into the ring with the Sword and Sorcery playset. Even though it was billed as a Sword and Sorcery playset, the set really was a throwback to the old Knights vs. Vikings scenarios. The major fantasy addition was the dragon figure. It really was a cool looking figure though. And some of you may notice that the dragon was basically the same figurine from the older HG Toys Godzilla playset. The creature was known as the Tricephalon. Though as a very young child, I think I just thought it was supposed to be King Ghidorah. Toys didn't always make sense back then. We just accepted that Luke Skywalker's action figure had a yellow lightsaber. HG Toys did offer a pared-down version of this playset with only 50 pieces, instead of the larger 90-piece playset. And still more toy companies were jumping on the fantasy figure playset War Wagon. The toy company Arco offered these small self-contained sets. These playsets were small and did not contain many features, including the almost always present play mats, so they almost functioned more like supplements to those bigger sets. While these sets were pretty common, the toy company Arco was better known for its strange and imaginative Otherworld action figure and accessories line. Several small monster figures came with a hollow tower to contain them in. These made great additions to other sword and sorcery play sets. They also sold the figures separately in the Mutants and Monsters collection. And these toys were repainted and re-released in 1991. But the greatest heroic sets of 1982 were still to come. In that momentous year, the toy company Fleetwood put out the Sword and the Sorcerer line of action-adventure playsets that were tied to the fantasy film of the same name. The toys had virtually nothing to do with the film, but they were some of the best sword and sorcery playsets available. They featured barbarians and goblin men, all with interchangeable glow-in-the-dark weapons. Oh, but that was far from all. They also offered several large PVC monster figures. The figures were only of the highest quality and a strict eye for detail was maintained at all times. Okay, that isn't true, but they were still pretty neat and they might be some of the best examples of the generic weird 1980s sword and sorcery toy line style. It's alive! Then Tim Mee, creator of the Notorious Galaxy Laser Team, which I mentioned in this video, also saw a quick way to success and produced the Fantasy Figures. The Fantasy Figures were again not part of a larger playset, but came in plastic bags and were sold in a wide variety of stores throughout the early to mid 1980s. Interestingly, the molds for these figures were modified versions of the earlier Marvel Super Heroes figures. See if you can guess which Marvel hero was the base for each figurine. And by 1983, several more toy companies were getting in on the action, including Helm Toy, who created three different sword and sorcery playsets that were very similar to the DFC playsets from 1981. The largest set was the Fortress of the Wizard King. According to the packaging, it was super deluxe. I can't really argue with their claim. This playset featured the heroic forces of the Wizard King, who were defending the tower against the vile and monstrous dragon warriors. The tower was made of cardboard but was huge by the standard set for these types of toys. Truly a marvel of sorcery and goblin craftsmanship. 
I always have to wonder what was in the minds of the creators of these strange and wonderful toy sets. You can tell that some effort went into the world building in many of these play sets. They are truly the unsung heroes of the toy industry. Perhaps I should say the Wizard Kings of the toy industry. The next size down playset from Helm was the Castle of the Three-Headed Dragon. I guess the Three-Headed Dragon was into real estate. And the smallest of the Helm playsets was Demon Mountain. All of these Helm sets were marvels of cardboard craftsmanship. They pushed the very limits of printed cardboard technology, and we must stand in awe. The dragon from the set was ripped directly from the DFC sets, but the three-headed version was modified. The Night Molds were taken directly from Britain's Knights of the Sword sets, but it appears that the Monster Army figures were decently imaginative originals. And speaking of imaginative and original figurines, take a look at the Fantasy Fortress by Durham Industries. Dear Lord, look at that artwork! Simply magnificent! Now that is a great example of early 1980s sword and sorcery artwork. <laughs> the Fantasy Fortress did not contain one of those snazzy play mats, but it made up for it with a mountain fortress to rival the mythical prehistoric mountains created by Marx. And the figurines are pretty great too. Conan, Red Sonja, and a couple of guys that could have been from John Carter of Mars. I didn't own this set, but I wish I had. And yet more play sets hit the toy shelves in 1983. The toy company Toyco produced the Dragons and Demons set. And once again, the box featured a great example of early 1980s sword and sorcery artwork, mixing spooky horror and haunted ride imagery with rock and roll barbarians. Oh look, a little Frazetta. <laughs> they also produced a smaller playset called the Tower of Terror. The figurines were really close to DFC's figurines, but they were slightly different. And Toyko wanted to get in on that supplement market too, so they offered smaller box sets of fantasy favorites. Not my favorites, but maybe they were the Wizard King's favorites. But that is going to bring us to one of the best sword and sorcery playsets ever manufactured. In 1983, Marty Toy produced the Masters of the, I mean, the Warriors of the Galaxy playset. It came with a play mat, a couple of mesas, spaceships, space tanks, great demi-human warriors, gold sci-fi fantasy barbarian gods, each with removable axes, swords, laser guns, and maces, as well as a severely out-of-scale, almost Castle Grayskull to defend. How can we be expected to teach children to learn how to read if they can't even fit inside the building? And here they are, the warriors of the galaxy, the golden heroes and the galactic demons. And in case you didn't want to purchase the full set, you could get them on blister cards also. It doesn't matter where they got their ideas. It only matters that they existed for a while in the Age of Legends, a time we call the 1980s. Thanks for joining us again in this journey into the war-torn lands of 1980s toys. Please hit the like button and subscribe to stay in touch with future content. There are many more battles we must fight before we see all the little things that made us heroic golden heroes of the 1980s. They're breakdance fighting! <laughs>